What's up, everybody? It has been a long time since I've been on camera, maybe like a month, over a month. I saw a movie today that was just so good, and I think that gave me like a good kickstart to want to do something. I want to talk about my favorite movies of the summer this year. Although I haven't been making a lot of videos and taking a lot of photos, I have been going to the movies still, and I've seen some really great movies this summer. So I want to talk about movies that I think are must-watch movies of this year. These are movies that were really, really strong, movies that stood out to me some of my favorites of the year overall, but I'm specifically focusing on summer. The last movie on this list is probably my favorite of the year so far, so stick around for that. So the first movie I wanna talk about is Plan B, which is the directorial debut of Natalie Morales. You may know her from Parks and Rec, Dead to Me, a short run show on NBC called Abby's. I think it got canceled, unfortunately, but she was good in it. This is a coming of age story about these two girls who go on a journey to get a plan B pill after one of them has unprotected sex the night before. This movie was so funny. It was so heartfelt. There are certain story beats in this movie that could have gone in a very predictable direction, but Natalie Morales, along with the writers and the actors, really made this movie stand out. This movie has a lot to say about our healthcare system, how sex is taught in high school, and the cultural impact that has on these kids growing up. I thought this was just so well acted, so well directed, and it's definitely a movie you should check out if you have Hulu. Next movie on my list, which I believe right now is only in theaters, but I'm sure it's gonna be on streaming on VOD fairly soon, which is The Night House. I think this was one of the most unique horror movies of the year, and it's one of two horror movies that are on my list, but this one I think really stands out. Rebecca Hall plays this woman who's dealing with the death of her husband, and she begins to investigate her husband because it seems like he was up to something very mysterious. As she looks more into what her husband was up to, creepy things start to happen, and it becomes clear she's not alone in her house. This movie was an interesting take on the haunted house subsection of horror movies. I thought this was really well acted, especially from Rebecca Hall. It was very creepy. The imagery, like the way they shot this movie was really beautiful. They do a lot of cool camera tricks to make you jump. And I mean, when I say jump, there were some pretty good jump scares in this movie. I think all of them got me. And then again, at the core of this story is this woman dealing with grief, but then also learning that her husband had a suspicious thing going on on the side that she had no idea about. And I think, especially the ending of this movie, it gets really crazy. This may not be for everybody, I'll say that, but... There's a really profound kind of deeper meaning towards it at the end. I think there's a very literal but also metaphorical conclusion. If you're looking for a horror movie that's both scary but also has something to say, then I think this is the one for you. I honestly don't think it made a lot at the box office, which is kind of sad, but hopefully it gets a second life on VOD. So if you do come across this one, I highly recommend it. I think you will not be disappointed. Now this next one is a pretty recent one that I saw, but I think it does really stand out in the summer as a whole and the year. Marvel Studios' Shang-Chi and Legend of the Ten Rings was really good. If you haven't heard of it, which would be surprising because you know the marketing is crazy since it's a Marvel movie. Shang-Chi is a story about a man who is the son of a powerful leader of this group called the Ten Rings. He escapes from a young age and goes into a life of hiding and creates a completely new life away from his family. He's called back into action by his father and he has to help fight to stop him because his father is up to something really bad. And I think this movie was awesome. But one thing to me that really puts this movie over the edge is the fight scenes. Oh my goodness. These are some of the best fight scenes I've seen in a Marvel movie in such a long time. This is heavily inspired by martial arts movies of the past, especially ones like Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee. This movie had such mind-blowing, like I audibly went, woo, ooh, like I was was into this movie so much, especially the action. The first half especially has a lot of great hand-to-hand action. It's not a bunch of cuts. It's not a bunch of shaky cam. You see everything that's happening. You can tell that the actors put in work. You can tell that the fight choreographers, the stunt choreographers, the director, the DP, everybody really put in effort to these fight scenes and that makes them stand out so much more because, you know, we do get some CGI stuff here and there and Marvel Studios is very big on that, you know, big CGI fights. But this one I think really is over the top. The action is so good. But along with the action, there's some great characters here. We have, of course, Simu Liu who kills it as Shang-Chi, Aquafina as his friend Katie, Tony Lung as the Mandarin, like the real Mandarin, not the one that we saw in Iron Man 3. I think this is a really great movie and I really hope people go to support it because it's only in theaters. It's not going to be at Disney Plus until I think 45 days after its initial release. So you have a lot of time to go see in theaters. Please go support this movie. 
This is a great movie for the Marvel Studios as a whole, but it's also a great representation for the Asian community. And I think we really got to go support movies like this. This is definitely one of my favorites of the year so far and definitely one of my favorites of summer 2021. Next, we have a big blockbuster, Free Guy, which going into it, I thought this was going to be just a fun blockbuster type of thing. You know, it's a big concept with the video games and stuff. But what really blew me away was the story. And I'll get into that without spoilers. But basically, this tells the story of an NPC who realizes that he's in a video game and then takes the world by storm as he tries to get to the same level as the players. It turns out there's something else going on behind the scenes and he has to help basically save the world he lives in, the game world that he lives in. First of all, it was fun. It was funny. That video game stuff, I think is one of the best video game movies, even though it's not technically based on an existing video game. It's one of the best movies about video games. Let's say that because you have great concepts. You have great visual effects, great little references. You have a lot of great cameos from well-known gamers, which I think really makes this a love letter to gaming as a whole. And then again, there's a story. There's a story between Joe Keery and Jodie Comer. They have this motivation that really pushes the story forward that really makes it more engaging, really makes you more invested in it because you see they have this goal that kind of relates to the video game. I don't want to give it away because honestly, I think it's better that you go into it not knowing about it. I think that's probably what really elevated this movie for me was that story between those two and seeing what those two are really up to and why they're a part of this and where they fit into the bigger puzzle of the movie. There are some really great surprises at the end. I will say that since this movie is Fox, but is owned by Disney, they take full advantage of that, and I think there's some really cool references and cameos in here that I think really just made this movie so fun. So I highly recommend checking it out if you can see it in theaters, but also if you don't get the chance, you could probably find it on VOD. Actually, Free Guy is a good segue into this next movie, which is actually a video game movie. Like, it's based off a video game technically, which is Werewolves Within. This is kind of like a whodunit mafia style movie based on a game that's kind of the same way called Werewolves Within. I actually never heard of that game before, but watching the movie, you could pretty much see it's kind of like Ultimate Werewolf, Mafia, that sort of thing. But it stars Sam Richardson and Milana Vaintrub. They play residents of this town. Someone in the town dies, and now it's up to them to figure out who is the killer, who is the werewolf that is picking off the townspeople one by one, essentially. So it's this really great ensemble movie. It's a really strong comedy, but I think it also has something to say about society. I know we live in a society, but I think... This has a good message. So it's not just a video game movie. It's not just a comedy. It has something to say. And there's some great, great performances here. Really strong comedic performances. I love the way it was shot. And above all, I think this movie just has heart, which I think really sets it apart. I wouldn't say it's super scary. It's a horror comedy technically, but I would say the comedy really does it. And I love the reveal at the end and how it ties into the greater theme of the movie. I highly recommend checking this one out. It is on streaming. It's on VOD. You can rent it on Amazon or wherever you rent your movies. It's a good movie. It's a good horror movie. And it's a really, really good video game movie. I would say it's probably one of the best ones I've seen in recent years. Next movie on my list is a documentary, Summer of Soul, which is also on Hulu, but I think it was showing in theaters at some point, but you can definitely watch it on Hulu now. This movie tells the story of the Harlem Music Festival, which is something that kind of got lost in history. In the beginning of the movie, they say that this footage has just been sitting in a basement for decades, and this is the first time it's actually seen the light of day since the festival itself. It's really mind-blowing. This movie tells the story of how this festival came together, all the acts. There are a lot of great interviews from people that were there, ranging from artists who were performing to people who were in the audience, some who were kids when this was happening, and just seeing all this culture this is just a really wholesome documentary too. I mean, they do touch on some things about what was happening in the 60s and stuff, but overall I would say this was a really wholesome documentary. I learned a lot actually, and it put me onto some really great music. I mean, I knew some of the artists there, but some of the songs I was hearing for the first time, it's a really good movie. You're watching pretty much a concert for a lot of it, but then you also have these cool interviews where you're getting more perspectives about this event, what it meant to people, what it meant for the music industry, what it meant for this community. I thought this was a really strong documentary and I'm sure you'll be listening to the playlist for a long time because they have some really good songs in there. I highly recommend it. Next is an A24 film actually, which is Zola. This is a movie telling the story that was told in this series, this Twitter thread years ago. I was on Twitter when this was happening, but for some reason I just don't remember this actual thread. Maybe I just never read it. But basically it's this woman telling the story of how she got roped into this road trip that took a really crazy turn. This was one of the most tense, suspenseful movies, but it also was kind of a dark comedy. 
because the situation itself is just so absurd. Along with the suspense and the comedy of the movie, I also like their storytelling techniques, how they play around with narration. Sometimes it switches between different perspectives. It's funny, but it also keeps you engaged in the story. This movie just really had me on the edge of my seat the whole time. Even though this is a true story, they did tweak some parts of it, but overall, it's still crazy to think that this happened, this whole situation happened. And it's really, you have to see it to believe it. I honestly can't talk enough about how crazy this movie was. Highly recommend it. You will not be disappointed and you will definitely be like, what is this? What am I watching? Next movie is Pig starring Nicolas Cage and Alex Wolf. This sort of is like a John Wick thing, but it goes in a different direction. It tells the story of this man whose truffle pig is kidnapped and he goes on a journey to try and get the pig back. When I first heard about that story, I thought it was going to be like a John Wick thing and it's going to be an action thing. But this goes in a completely different direction. This is a very somber movie. This is very down to earth. It's very personal. You're telling the story about this man, his journey, where he came from, why he is the way he is. You get a lot of his backstory. He's also accompanied by this guy, Amir, who was sort of his business associate who helps him go on this journey trying to find where his pig ended up. He has a backstory of his own too. So ultimately, you're really getting to know these characters. On top of that, I think these are some very strong performances from Alex Wolf and Nick Cage, Nick Cage especially. This is definitely one to watch. Again, if you go into it expecting a John Wick type of thing where he's basically killing a bunch of people to try to get this pig back, then you will probably be disappointed. But if you just go into it with an open mind, this is a character study where you're really focusing on who these characters are, what their motivations are, and where they came from. Next movie on my list is from Netflix. I actually spoke about this movie as part of a trilogy earlier this year, which is Fear Street. For me, the standout of this trilogy was part two, 1978, which talks about the story of C. Berman, how she lost her sister, and how this plays into the curse as a whole and the story of Sarah Fear. Two things that I think really make this stand out among the other two is the storytelling and the characters. Across the board, I do care about the characters, of course, but I think I was the most attached to the 1978 characters. I really cared about them. Going into it, you know at least one of them's gonna die. So knowing that going into it, you have this extra layer of suspense because you don't know how or when it's gonna happen, but you know it's gonna happen. Also, this movie goes more into detail about the origins of the curse and how it relates to Sarah Fear and Shady Side as a whole. There's some really good story threads too, some connections to the first movie and some seeds planted for the third movie that I think just really cements this is a really good movie. Also, there's some really great references to old horror movies like Friday the 13th, Halloween, that I think really makes this a love letter to the horror genre. Honestly, this is one of my favorite horror movies of the year, right up there with The Night House. Again, it's a great continuation of the first movie, but it also really lays the groundwork for the last movie and really cements this as a solid trilogy. So I highly recommend watching all three movies, but for me, my personal favorite was Fear Street Part Two, 1978. And as promised, the final movie on my list is probably my favorite of the year, but definitely my favorite of summer 2021, which was Coda. And this movie, I think, really inspired me to make this video because again, I was in kind of a funk. Also, I'm on this social media break as I'm making this video right now. So once I saw this movie, I was like, I have to get this out there. I have to talk about this movie. I, I love this movie so much, but I had nowhere to really put it because I'm not on social media. So I couldn't tweet it. I couldn't put it on Instagram. I had nowhere to go. And I was like, I have to get this out there. So this movie kind of gave me kind of a creative spark. It gave me the inspiration to make this video, but I loved it so, so much. Amelia Jones plays Ruby, who is the child of deaf parents. She's the only member of her family who can actually hear. And that's kind of where the name comes from, which is an acronym, Child of Deaf Adult. But then CODA is also a music term, meaning sort of the end of a piece, a music piece. So it kind of has that double meaning, which is really cool. But this movie was so well acted, it's heartfelt and it has a lot to say. This movie gives an insider perspective on the deaf community. You see what it's like for a child who's living in a family where they can't hear what they're doing. So you see those everyday things that they're doing, but they're making a lot more noise than normal because they're not aware of the noise that they're actually making. So you get that perspective, but you also see how the community around them treats them because they're kind of in this small town in Massachusetts. They're the only deaf family. So you see how people treat them. You see how there's not a lot of accommodations for them. Ruby is their translator, so she has a lot of pressure on her, but she also has her own dreams because she wants to be a singer and she wants to go to college to study singing. So Ruby has this conflict and she's trapped between these two worlds and it's really heartbreaking to see this and it's really great dramatic performance from Melia Jones. But then there's also good comedic performances, especially from Eugenio Derbez, who plays her teacher. Again, he also brings some of the heart, but he is really funny in the movie too. 
This movie honestly was so emotional, so powerful. I'm not gonna lie, I definitely teared up a couple times in this movie, especially towards the third act. It's definitely a tearjerker, but it's also really fun. It's really heartwarming. And it gives you a new perspective if you're not really familiar with the deaf community and deaf culture. This is definitely my favorite movie of the summer, 2021. It might even be my favorite movie of the year overall. It's still a little early, there's still half a year left, but as of right now, I would say this is probably my favorite movie of the year. It really blew me away. I really can't stop thinking about it. I highly recommend watching it. It's available to stream on Apple TV+, Plus. but if you have a theater in your area showing it, I highly recommend going to see it in a theater too because this is just a really good movie and I think more people definitely should watch it. And honestly, I just can't stop thinking about it. It's so good. So those are 10 must-see movies from summer 2021. If there's a movie you saw that you think belongs in this list, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching. Again, I've been in this kind of creative funk and this is one of the first things I've done since, so that's good. I hope to talk more about some movies and some other stuff for the rest of this year, but until then, I will see you in the next one. Thank you.